Hi everyone, we'll get started in just a moment. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan McQuinn. I'm a senior research analyst here at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. I want to welcome you to today's event, uh, Advancing the Next Wave of Aviation Innovation. Uh, before we begin, just a few quick logistical notes. First, the event will be recorded and live cast. So um, if you're joining us from online, welcome. We're, we're uh, happy to have you here. Uh, second, uh, oh, and also you can follow along in the, with the conversation, hashtag ITIF Innovation on Twitter. Second, we have uh, plenty of time at the end for Q&A, so feel free to uh, come up with your questions, both for the folks here in the room and those online. Remember, tweet those questions at us again at hashtag ITIF Aviation. So let's get started. Um, Airplanes today are not all that dissimilar from airplanes that we had in 1960 and how we actually interact with those airplanes as well. Uh, certain commercial, certainly commercial airplanes have gotten a lot more efficient and they offer a lot more amenities than those in the past such as you know your internet or your personal entertainment while you're riding that commercial airliner. But we don't interact with them very much. We're not taking airplane, uh, most of us are not taking flights every day or, or even multiple times a year. Um, this is mostly due to a number of factors, but it's because innovation in commercial aviation is primarily incremental, where firms make relatively minor improvements to existing products and processes, improving pre-existing attributes in order to, make, uh, to meet a minimum standard of compliance. However, based on uh, the work of some of these panelists here today, and also um, many, uh, across the field. I believe that we are poised for a new era of transformational innovation in aviation. Autonomous flights could improve safety. Uh, they could allow for better imp uh, improvement of management of the national airspace system. Flying taxis, also known as vertical takeoff and landing uh, aircraft or VTOLs, could Im vastly improve that last mile of travel for each of us, allowing us to take a taxi uh, you know, to the airport very quickly uh, over uh, in the air. Supersonic planes can nearly have the time it takes to get between locations and their eventual predecessors, hypersonic planes, uh, or for those who may not be uh, aware of the nomenclature, those are airplanes that go five times the speed of sound or greater, they could radically improve speeds even further. Imagine going from New York to Tokyo in two hours, for example, right? So uh, these innovations will be also be key in allowing the U.S. industry uh, to remain competitive with the rest of the world. But we need to address safety before we can really get into a lot of these awesome uh, aviation innovations. So the question I hope to explore during today's event is how policymakers both in the U.S. and abroad can ensure safety in the airspace while also allowing innovation to proceed apace. Uh, I got a fantastic set of panelists here today for you uh, all to hear from. Unfortunately, Paul Fontaine from the FAA uh, had something come up at the last minute and is no longer able to join us, but that will not stop us. We will forge ahead. Um, starting on my left, we have Greg Bowles, who is the Vice President of Global Innovation and Policy at the General Aviation Manufacturer Association. Next, we have Eli Dorado, the head of policy and communications at Boom Technologies. Before Boom, he was a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center for George Mason University. Next, we have Jay Dreyer, who is the deputy associate administrator for aeronautics programs at NASA. Previously, Jay was director of the Advanced Air Vehicles and Fundamental Aeronautics programs. Um, and finally, we have Jenny Rosenberg, who is the founder of JTR Strategies. Uh, previously, Jenny served as the acting assistant secretary for aviation and international affairs at the U.S. Department of Transportation and as the assistant administrator of communications at the Federal Aviation Administration. So thank you to all four of you for being here. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I want to start out uh, with the current state of the U.S aviation industry. Let's discuss some of the progress that we've made over the last few years and hopefully expect to see in the next five to ten years. So Greg, I'm going to take it to you first. Uh, you deal with a, ride, a wide variety of uh, companies trying, out to ex trying to explore new market opportunities. Uh, can you describe some of the advances that the private sector is working on to improve commercial aviation? Absolutely. Thank you very much uh, for the question. So we we have seen um, a new era of aviation starting to open up over the last five years. Um, as 
hybrid and electric aircraft, uh, sorry, hybrid and electric uh, technologies have, have spread across the road vehicles. We're now seeing that happen in the air. We're also seeing increased automation move into the air. And so if you think about it from the, the perspective you described, safety, um, we're seeing vehicles with technologies on board that are more highly redundant, that are more reliable, that are lower maintenance, um, and have the ability to fill in that gap of human error. So even, uh, you know, all of us pilots, uh, we train and do our absolute best, but um, we're human. And so technology has the ability to integrate with us in a really w safe and uh, enhancing way, um, or we can do things uh, that, that are not beneficial. And, and the, the interesting time is we're seeing um, technologies be implemented in much smarter, newer ways that, that really can make us better pilots and uh, and let us do things that we're good at as, as humans uh, in the cockpit. So, so those things are what everybody's focused on at this time, and I think that's why we're all so excited uh, to see what's happening over the next five years. Thank you. That's great, yeah. Um, Eli, I'm going to go to you. Um, you are working. You at Boom Technologies are working on a supersonic airplane, right? And we've had supersonic airplanes since the 1970s. The Concorde, famously nose down airplane, um, but it was retired uh, earlier in the in the aughts. So, um, where what is the current state of the supersonic industry? How did it get here? And what are you and your team uh, working on to you know solve this problem? Yeah, thanks, Alan, and it's great to be here with you, with you all. Um, <coughs> So at Boom, what we're doing, the, the vision for Boom is really to eliminate the barriers to experiencing the planet, right? And those barriers are, are time, money, and hassle. And, and to get there, you know, we need to solve the problem of supersonics. And, and so basically, we had Concorde, as Alan said. It was, it was not efficient. It was a uh, Cold War glory project that was uh, done by the, the, the French and the British um, as a joint venture. And of course, most joint ventures between the French and the British have been wars. Um, <laughs> and um, and, and, it, and it was done basically to beat the Soviets, who also had their own uh, supersonic program uh, at the time. And, and the U.S. at the same time in, in, the, in the 60s had launched its own uh, supersonic program that got canceled in 1971. Um, and so basically uh, all three of these programs were basically done, uh, you know, for reasons of, of national pride, of, of, you know, trying to get there first, um, not really as a sort of ec economically sustainable um, business model. And so, you know, between between the fact that they started uh, in this sort of economically unsustainable way and that the, the fact that the political sort of competition uh, resulted in a, a lot of barriers to actually uh, flying supersonic uh, everywhere in the world because of the sonic boom ban, um, it basically halted, I think, innovation in in supersonic specific R&D for, for several decades, um, really slowed it down anyway. And the, you know, basically in the, in the last 50 years, um, the industry is really focused on, on sort of incremental innovations, as Alan said, um, that are focused on subsonic aircraft. And so we're finally to the point where with the, that 50 years of advancement in propulsion and materials in, in sort of computational design tools, we're, we're at the point where we can do um, significantly better than Concorde, even though we haven't had any supersonic specific breakthroughs. So just, just leveraging the existing industry's um, incremental progress, we can, we can start to take a, a big leap forward. And what we're hoping is, is you know, we can, we can show that there's a big market for this, that it can be done economically sustainably, um, and, and that that will kickstart a, sort of a new uh, renaissance in supersonic specific R&D, and then we can go to, to Model B, uh, which is faster and cheaper to fly on and, and you know, will uh, enable you to get anywhere on the planet, you know, within uh, four hours for $100. Uh, you know, it might take a few decades to get that, that far, but, um, yeah. but that's, that, you know, that's the goal, and it's, it's basically start with a, a Mach 2.2 airliner that has business class economics. And, and then um, go from there and, and keep driving down the, the time, money, and, and hassle that it takes to, to travel. And so you briefly mentioned there, there's a speed limit, but can you describe what in the United States, what is that regulatory barrier? Sure. In the United States and, and in, in several other countries, though not all, uh, there's a, a, a limit that says you can't go faster than Mach 1. Uh, it's, not even, it's not even really um, 
It doesn't matter if you make a sonic boom that reaches the ground. It doesn't matter uh, uh, anything else ab about that. Um, doesn't matter if you're a civil aircraft and you, you you're limited to going less than Mach one. And so that's I think that's one of the factors that really um, halted uh, a lot of this R and D effort into supersonic specific technology because. Everybody knows that this is the wrong policy. Everybody knows it's eventually going to re be repealed and replaced with a, a sonic boom standard. But for for businesses to start investing in in some of these really specific technologies, they have to have certainty that that they're going to be able to get there and that um, that it's going to be uh, the policy is going to be replaced on some uh, known timetable. Thank you. So we have kind of a, a table setting for where commercial industry is at today. But Jay, I want to go to you. Uh, cause NASA is kind of in the smack dab of all the middle of this. You uh, deal with a lot of the, the private sector and you're helping them innovate. And you also work with uh, regulators to provide them the data they need to understand some of these innovations. So can you describe NASA's strategic thrusts um, and some of the uh, ARM, ARMD uh, projects that you oversee? Uh, sure, absolutely. So thank you again for the opportunities. So at NASA Aeronautics, we're all about innovation and discovery and flight. And so one of the things that we did was, was laid out a, a strategic plan that contains six thrust areas. Uh, think of them as swim lanes to help focus you know, where we're looking uh, at and directing our, our research. And so one of them is on safe and efficient global operations. Uh, when we're talking about the vehicles, they have to have an airspace to operate in. And whether that's the, the traditional national airspace that we think of today, how can we more efficiently utilize that? But how do you also take advantage of uh, new opportunities, for example, the smaller vehicles that are going to have to operate, unmanned vehicles, urban air mobility, and things like this? We need to have a system that's able to control and direct uh, all of these type of vehicles and applications. So we've got research that, that's focused in that area. Uh, the second strategic thrust is innovation in commercial supersonic flight, exactly in, in line with what Eli was just talking about. Uh, I can resonate with this. I, I just last week, for example, I was in, in Russia. It's a long eight-hour time difference, so apologize if I'm a little t uh, jet lagged still from that flight. Um, but it, it is all about uh, connecting these large urban centers and bringing the world closer together. And at NASA, we've, uh, we're looking in particular at overcoming some of these barriers uh, to supersonic flight. And so Eli mentioned the prohibition on overland supersonic flight due to the sonic boom. Uh, that's a good example where we've done research that shows that we think it's, it's possible to cre create such a low um, sonic boom, it, we might not even call it a sonic boom anymore, it's, uh, a sonic thump, that you can barely hear this but we don't have a regulation in place to, to do that. So we've got to do the research and provide data to support that. But it's more than just the, the sonic boom issue. Uh, how do we uh, create vehicles that are more efficient? How do we uh, attack the uh, landing and takeoff noise? Other areas that we're also interested in that we're working on when it comes to commercial supersonic flight. And a lot of that research is also applicable to our third area uh, of more efficient uh, commercial transport. And so in, within this thrust, we're looking at how do we build vehicles that are, are more efficient, that are quieter, and to really take advantage of some new technologies for both the larger vehicles that, that we fly on, we're com uh, used to in, in commercial transportation, but also looking at, at smaller uh, vertical lift uh, applications and how do we make those vehicles that may potentially open up new markets as well. Uh, and then the fourth area is is a transition to alternative propulsion and power. And, and this is an area, again, that, that, that Greg uh, uh, alluded to as well. How do we look at different uh, potential applications or architectures when it comes to how we power and propel our vehicles. And, and the research actually is, is connected, but it's even diff uh, different depending on the scale. So for example, how could we even look at new ideas for, for large uh, commercial vehicles? We're a long ways away from doing all electric flight for a vehicle of that scale, but there are new architectures that we could take advantage of with more electric um, applications that could become much more efficient than, than what we fly today all the way down the scale to the smaller vehicles. How can we safely operate um, more electric or hybrid electric type of, of concepts and, and vehicles? So those are other areas that we're looking at. Uh, and the fifth area is, is something that we call in-time um, system-wide safety awareness. And so with the, the growing complexity of the national airspace, how do we ensure that that safety record, which is paramount to, to um, to air travel and something that we assume and to sometimes almost take for granted today uh, how safe the system really is. When we're adding in these new modes of flight, whether it's um, 
uh, urban air mobility or, or greater application of unmanned systems or even expanding the use of the traditional airspace, how do we ensure that these advances are safe and how we're going to be able to do that? How can we take advantage of the data mining that we have available to us to collect the information to become more prognostic and predict the, the issues that we have rather than a system that says we've had a failure or a fault, let's go back and figure out what happened and then correct it. So how can we change that paradigm? Those are examples that, that NASA's uh, looking at. And then finally, um, another area that Greg also mentioned, a short autonomy for aviation transformation. We're looking at how is autonomy going to make a difference and how do you safely apply that in, in the aviation system to make a difference to these missions, whether it's how we fly today or to en enabling and opening up some of these new markets as well. So trying to bring that all together and, and pull this together, it really is an exciting time at NASA. That's great. Yeah, thank you for that overview. Hopefully we can dive into some of those topics in a little bit. But I want to pull Jenny in on this. So you worked at both the Department of Transportation, you worked at the FAA, and you've seen firsthand how an agency can approach new uh, crafting policies around a new technology, specifically UAS or drones. Um, so how does the Department of Transportation and the FAA approach understanding a new technology? Um, can you explain uh, some of your experiences and and, and and, and please, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, so when I was at the FA, it was really um, at a very interesting time when we were uh, beginning to integrate drones. Mm -hmm. And the experience was, um, as Jay mentioned, dealing with this perfect safety environment that, uh, that we have in the United States and then starting to bring some risk into the system. And the FAA takes that very seriously. It is it is their pride, and they should be proud of it because um, you don't see this type of airspace anywhere else. And so, what I can tell you is that the the people at the FAA take this very seriously, and their approach is data driven. It is safety minded, and it is done methodically. And when we were um, when we were looking at at integration, a lot of it was how can we work with industry to bring this new industry into the safety system that GA knows, that commercial aviation knows, that cargo knows, because this whole ecosystem is basically working perfectly. And so we need to educate this new system of users. And so that was one of the major challenges, I would say, for the FAA at the time. And they've been continuing to work on that, um, the Department of Transportation too. And so you saw these different layers one of the the projects that we worked on was the registration system and that was not just to track drones but it was also to bring new users into the system and to educate them as they were onboarded as they became pilots so you know you saw a lot of the tech community come into aviation and as we did that we really needed to educate people so that was one of the most important and i would say challenging pieces of of, of integration mm. and um what we've seen since then and what has been really interesting to me is um, all of the different layers that have gone into integration that are just beyond that go beyond safety we have seen the FAA start to begin to broaden um, you know they are very they've always looked at safety security has been a layer but I would say with the integration of of drones they've really had to start to work more closely with the security community uh, because the drones bring a new risk they bring new capabilities and so you've seen some of that um, begin to be dealt with in policy and the FAA bill and it will continue to be dealt with um, as these new systems continue to, to integrate but but overall that the FAA really is takes a safety approach to anything that that they do and it's um, as anyone can tell you you walk into a room with the FAA and they you know they're unwavering in their commitment to safety so I think this is a great example of how um, a new technology is confronted by these regulators and they have to start rethinking and, 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 and addressing around it. So Greg, I want to pull you back in and, and um, how do you see some of these other, um, do you think the lessons that they, the FAA learned from, from UAS integration will play out in some of these other types of technologies? So I think I think that that absolutely, Alan, I think that is the case. So over the, the last 10 years, uh, the UAS world has 
come on board and and um, I think if there are any criticisms it was that that world didn't join at the hip they they went in kind of uh, various directions some, some of the organizations worked together others worked in other directions and it made it difficult for the regulator to to have a common understanding of what was coming and as a result um, the FA would admit I think that they were a little behind the curve in adapting into uh, what was happening the unmanned aircraft uh, revolution that was occurring um, we certainly uh, looked at that in the manned aviation world and, and with our changes coming online and we joined together um, early on about five years ago we all kind of started working around the table as a global community uh, and we, we engaged with the global authorities so we worked with uh, the FAA with other regulators around the world the key regulators and and I will say that the FAA has adapted really well so the FAA has brought their key folks together they've recognized that these changes are real and they're coming quickly and the FAA is, is trying to employ their powerful tools to make sure that number one we deal with this issue um, safely right so this is very important that that safety remain the top priority we're starting to look at noise issues so how do we deal with these these vehicles and bring these new vehicles into into more daily life in a nice quiet fashion uh, and then the convenience piece is really important as well so the FAA is is understanding these technologies has taken their lessons learned um, in fact they're reorganizing they're reorganizing the um, the FAA in in various ways to, to be more nimble and um, you'll see things like the FAA FAA Innovation Center that's now come online to allow new applicants to come in and, and have a quick understanding of what's what's evolving. So, so it is a new FAA that's trying to take their lessons learned as as Jenny laid out and uh, and and do some new things. And Jay, how how does NASA work with regulators to understand and uh, uh, get data on some of these new and evolving technologies? Yes, so so that's a good question. And and Jenny kind of alluded to it that there that the FAA and and really all regulators take a data driven approach. And so that is one area where NASA does play a role is providing that that unbiased data to help inform regulation. And I'll use supersonic uh, the the low boom is is a perfect example of that. So um, here we have a regulation that says we're not allowed to, in this country to fly uh, above Mach 1. It's slightly different, you know, from an international standard, but essentially says the same thing. We're, we're not prohibited, or uh, we are not allowed to fly supersonically over land. So how are we going to change that? I, I mentioned before that we think we've come up with the idea of technologies that actually allow to cr uh, us to reduce this, this boom signature, but we don't have a regulation in place, so that needs to change. Uh, the only way to do that is to provide actual data that says here's a level that would be deemed acceptable to the public um, and the only way to collect that is to actually go out and fly. So this is an area where we work with both the FAA but also on an international basis with the International C Civil Aviation Organization or ICAO. And so they've been very clear, they've laid out a plan that says yes we can do this but it will require collection of flight data to do that. So this is a case where NASA has um, has embarked on an effort to collect such data. So what we've done is twofold. One is to create the aircraft to actually collect this. So we've just recently announced the X-59, a low boom flight demonstrator, an aircraft that will exhibit this signature that we think will be acceptable to the public. So we are, we're actually building this vehicle as we speak. We've um, That started and the first flight will be in 2021. Um, but at the same time, we also have to, to work on the actual collection or how do we uh, to measure that community response. And so we're, we have research that's geared in that area. Um, and in fact, just recently, early, uh, uh, last month in fact, we ran a set of experiments off the coast, coast of Texas where we took not a low boom flight demonstrator, but as close as we could get, we found a way to, to simulate that, that signature by flying an F-18. Um, the problem with that is when we do the special maneuver, it may lay down a, a low boom signature in some places, but it'll concentrate booms in others. So it's not ideal for flying over land, but we can near coastal communities. So we flew this flight over the water. We um, we boomed, if you will, uh, the, the, the community of Galveston, but we had a very specific um, uh, measurement process in place there to collect data. How did we respond? How did we work with the local community? So this is more than just providing data, if you will, to the FAA or to ICAO. How do we work with the communities when we're collecting it? How do we work with the researchers? How do we bring the community together to do this measurement? So this was the first of those kind of experiments. And that way we can, can continue to perfect these methods so that when we have the low boom flight demonstrator, the X-59 ready, we have the means to collect the data at the same time. And we can do these um, flight campaigns around the country to collect the data that would be necessary for actually changing a regulation. So while NASA is not responsible for the actual regulation itself, we do participate in how you would collect the data that would make a difference. 
that, that approach is, is incredibly important as we start to look at these new technologies because the, the technology is there, but it is working with communities. It's making the argument to the public, the, the public health benefits, the economic benefits, uh, the disruption to communities is, is real, but it can be worked through. We saw a lot of problems. We've seen problems with, um, with next gen, uh, but I think that the FAA has learned a lot from, from some of the, the issues of the past. Um, community meetings. I don't, you know, you don't necessarily think when you're implementing new flight paths that you, you know, need to do community meetings. But we learned um, when I was at the FAA that you did need to be in the communities. And now we're we're looking at this. And Greg, um, I think that you're part of many organ one of many organizations that's sort of pushing for this type of a policy change and approach. That's great. Um, so, Ginny, you actually had mentioned earlier the FAA Reauthorization Act that passed earlier this year. Um, I'm going to open this one up to the folks who know uh, some of the internal details of this bill, but um, what is the impact on certain uh, emerging technologies, such as supersonic flight or, or any of these other ones we've talked about? Oh, uh, well, I think for um, for the, the hobbyists, uh, one of the major changes has been um, that the FAA now can regulate all drones. Before there was a carve out for, for hobbyists, and that was, I would say, a hard fought battle in the FAA bill. But um, I think in order for th this technology to see uh, to move forward, uh, because of the security risks in the system that sort of weren't there because technology has improved and the drones, the sizes have, they're either smaller or bigger, they have better cameras. Um, there are many different issues that that are present now that weren't present in, um, in 2012 and before. Um, that to me was a huge uh, difference and it's made, you know, it's huge for the for the um, hobbyists, but I think that that's going to be a way to give more, you know, to give the security community what they need. You've seen remote ID standard that is going to be implemented, and that is going to be important for tracking and making sure that we know who's flying where. But all of these different um, regulations are going to be very important to move this industry forward. So Eli, what did the what was in the FAA reauthorization that dealt with supersonics? Yeah, so I mean it was it was um, very positive uh, message from Congress on on supersonics and and the basically um, I would say the, the bill did three things for supersonics. So one one of the challenges that we have um, is that that currently that no uh, landing and takeoff noise standard exists for supersonics. Like if you go read the regulation. It doesn't tell you what to design to. It doesn't tell you what you have to do to be certified, and so um, we were very happy that the um, that the FAA reauthorization bill um, directed FAA to um, to basically come up with with standards for um, how how they would certify a, a supersonic airplane, and so we're we're working with FAA now to provide um, you know data that that shows what's economically reasonable and, and technologically practicable, but um, but. You know, having that having that certainty that we're going to be able to come to a to an outcome there um, is it, extraordinarily helpful. Uh, the second thing is it does is it um, is it directs FAA to take take a, a, a international leadership posture. So um, you know, aviation is a is a global industry. Uh, we have to be able to you know, if we want to take off in the United States, we have to be able to land somewhere else. Um, and so so it it. it basically reinforced what FAA was already doing, which was uh, exercising that international leadership. Um, and then finally, it, it basically instructed FAA to um, to revisit every two years whether they have enough data to repeal the uh, the, the sonic boom uh, or the, the Mach 1 prohibition. So, so you know, what Jay was talking about earlier of, of NASA gathering data, um, what's great about that, about this provision is that is that we're not going to go another 40 years uh, with a uh, with a with a Mach 1 ban um, as as the data is produced by NASA and others. Uh, FAA is going to have to you know look every two years and decide well do we have enough data to to actually um, make some make some forward progress here. Great, thank you. I want to take this conversation from domestic to international. So I'm going to first go to Greg. Um, how do you see the U.S. Uh, compared to peers in other areas uh, in terms of competitiveness in this industry? 
So one of the important things from the aviation manufacturer's standpoint is that uh, aviation is a global market. So you can't um, differentiate a product by market segments because it's a big world out there and, and putting all the time and effort it takes to certify and produce a safe uh, efficient vehicle and then do that differently all over the world is a very difficult thing to do mm -hmm. so we work very globally in this industry mm -hmm. um, and and we do that through ICAO we do that with large uh, aviation authorities like FAA like EASA we work with Transport Canada the ANEC Brazil there are aviation authorities all over the world that work very closely together that's an important net of communication that happens um, what we certainly do see is that in certain areas, certain regulators will emphasize um, priorities. And so we'll see things like currently uh, Europe has emphasized uh, urban mobility. And you'll see a lot of discussion about urban mobility in Europe. Um, we're starting to see uh, in the U.S. this is also an important constant that's starting to grow. Uh, we've seen companies like Kitty Hawk, uh, which is the, one of the Larry Page companies that's been discussed, um, move to New Zealand to try to do some early operations. So there, there are um, different avenues depending on, on your goal, but in the end, as, a, as an industry gets mature, having all the authorities working together across the line is, is really important. And to be frank, that's what I see the FAA do so well. So the FAA's methodical approach and, and coordinated approach is, is really strong, and, uh, and they've done that well for a long time. I'm going to go to Ginny because well, while you were at the Department of Transportation, you actually uh, engaged directly with some of these other international regulators and in some of the forums like ICAO, the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization, for those who are worried about, um, you know, <laughs> acronym soup. <laughs> so I wanted to go to you. Um, how do you see the U.S. engaging with other international regulators? No, I, one of the, um, the industries that the U.S. I think does well globally is engaging globally is in aviation and I can tell you that at least when I was there and and I, I think it's carried on since that there's constant coordination um, talking to our regulators our brothers and sister regulators abroad I mean we were constantly working with other governments um, not only to cooperate but to teach about our airspace and our airspace management there was when I was there I spent a lot of time um, engaging with the Chinese on airspace management and um, we also work closely with um, the Australians and we work closely with the Canadians and the Europeans um, but there's so many wonderful cooperative relationships and there's so many ways for us to learn from each other it's it's really a, a remarkable field um, but at the same time I think that we are also mindful of the competitive nature of this industry mm -hmm. and we want US companies to do well we want international companies to do well when they come here and so we are trying constantly trying to figure out how to improve that relationship and how to make this to make our um, our airspace and our aerospace environment um, welcoming to a global company and also how we can see our companies succeed abroad awesome Jay, you just got back from Moscow where you were doing just that, interacting with other um, aviation entities from governments. So will you describe what NASA does with other international partners? Right. So actually, it's a very close parallel to what, what Jenny just described from the regulators. The same thing happens at the research agency perspective. So uh, there is something called the International Forum for Aviation Research, or IFAR. And, and this is a collection of all the major research uh, organizations across the globe that are focused on aeronautical research. There's uh, 26 members to, 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 to IFAR, 17 were represented at this meeting that we just had in, in, in Moscow. And so this is, um, it, like I said, a parallel to what you see on the regulatory side. This is coming together from the major research organizations that say, where do we need to work together to help provide the data, to, to help the regulators or to help others uh, create a, a more safe and efficient um, uh, aviation system around the world. And, and also draws on something else that Jenny mentioned. You know, we have to be very careful of where that distinction lies between what is really competitive research that needs to stay within you know respective countries and what needs to be shared and, and, and cooperated on and so supersonics is uh, research is a good example we had a focus uh, on that topic in fact just last year we had a follow-up at the meeting uh, on Moscow where we talked about you know the most recent developments and this is a good example where that that experiment I just talked about in Galveston NASA is going to share the what we've learned from that and the data with that with the rest of the world we want them to know this we want them to help provide input to help um, 
uh, us with how we're going to, to construct the, the flight phase when we have the X-59 so that we can collect the data that is needed by the international community to actually set a regulation. So it doesn't have just a, a U.S. focus is less likely, is going to be much less likely to succeed. And, and just exactly what, what Eli mentioned before, this has to be uh, viewed through an international lens. You're not just going to fly within the United States. Uh, ideally, you want a market where you can operate around the world. And so in order to do that, you have to work with the rest of the world to ensure that you have the data-driven uh, approach to, to really inform those kind of regulations. And so this is a perfect example of that working out, where we're helping to um, bring the world together on the research side so that the um, certification side and the regulatory side can do their job as well. So, Eli, do you want to follow up on that and talk about some of the international barriers and how y'all are working with other uh, regulators abroad like ICAO? Sure, yeah. So uh, I was at an ICAO meeting all last week, actually, <laughs> uh, working on, on exactly, you know, uh, some of these issues, the noise standards and so on, uh, both for sonic boom and for landing and takeoff. And I, uh, you know, absolutely agree um, that these standards need to be harmonized uh, internationally. And I think it's very important to... Um, to bolster, you know, what, what FAA has done, which is support a data-driven process, because otherwise uh, these standards become very politicized. And, and <laughs> it's very important to, to, uh, to keep, keep the standard-making process uh, as technical as possible and as, as data-driven as possible so that we avoid um, some of this international uh, competition and, and rent-seeking through, through standards development. So we've waded through some of the, um, you know, uh, current regulations and international regulations, but let's start, let's look to the future. Let's talk about technologies that we could see in, you know, five to ten to twenty years uh, or even longer. Um, so, Greg, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, what is the current state of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft? Some people may, um, when they think about this, it's a VTOL. Some people might think about this like Jetsons, or if you if you um, watch the Fifth Element, the, the flying taxis, right? So this is kind of something that's science fiction, and it's far off in the future, but a lot of really smart people are working on it. So um, if you could describe that, uh, absolutely. So. Um the the holy grail in these vehicles, I think, is that they make no noise, they have no emissions, and they have infinite safety, right? So that's the ultimate goal, and they cost nothing to ride on. So how close are we? How close are we to that goal? Um, well, so the first question would be uh, all electric. So is it feasible to to do these vehicles in an all electric fashion? And and we've talked a little bit here about the state of that. Um, what happens is the bigger the vehicle, the faster you travel and the farther you go, that's energy, right? And so uh, battery technology is currently at the state of energy where we're seeing vehicles currently flying in the airspace, um, in, in restricted and military airspace and in uh, areas out, outside of public view, um, where we're, f we're flying two to, f to six seat vehicles that travel between 100 and 200 knots um, around an hour to an hour and a half. And so uh, when you look at your traditional aviation mindset, you say, that's not very useful. You know, I, I want to go farther than that. But the question then becomes, is there any use to that? And, and this is the idea of eVTOL and urban mobility, right? So currently I live in Annapolis, and I drive into the city in the morning, and I go home in, in the evening. And you could imagine yourself sitting there watching a rush hour in front of you and saying, if I could hop on a magic carpet that would lift me over this traffic and I would have a 10 minute commute into the city versus having an hour and a half commute into the city, that's quite an interesting opportunity for me. And maybe each of us that choose to live, you know, I used to live downtown here and, and that's a wonderful walk, but if I could have both of those worlds, right, a 10 minute commute to work and live out by the Chesapeake Bay. That's a wonderful world. And so that's what we're starting to see. We're starting to see vehicles um, being flight tested, being flown, being matured that do this. Um, the question of, of how loud are they, this is also really interesting about noise. So electric motors can create torque. That means we can turn propellers much more slowly than we have traditionally with electric, with gas motors. And, and therefore we can be very, very quiet if we design them in that way. And then the redundancy that electric brings and, and microelectronics bring can make really, really remarkably safe vehicles. So it really, as, a, as an engineer, um, it's a really exciting time. As a pilot, I can't wait to fly these vehicles. And as uh, a person of the world, I can't wait till they change my life. 
It's, that's awesome and very interesting. It's it's a it's a good segue into talking about um, some some of the inner energy use in aviation and some of the work that you're uh, doing in, at NASA to create more uh, to to not only create safe and efficient urban. Uh, Urban air travel, um, but also to 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 uh, increase the energy efficiency of some of these vehicles. So, if you would talk about that, yes, yeah, so, so absolutely. Um, and we're really looking at all scales. I mean, Greg, a perfect, a really good example of the potential benefits that that some of these new EV toll uh, vehicles may bring. But there's a lot we still don't understand about that. How do I build a vehicle like that? That's going to be very efficient. That is going to be very quiet. Can I make the design trades when I'm doing that? We're used to, for example, designing helicopters that have one main rotor and a tail rotor for for most configurations. But what happens when that's replaced by 14 smaller motors that are now driven by a uh, 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 an electric propulsion system where I can vary the speed. And while it could offer great benefits, if we do it uh, poorly, it could actually have the, the adverse effect. It could create you know strange tonals or things that are uh, a, an issue that would cause a, a public acceptance problem. Um, so we're trying to, to not design a specific vehicle, but rather how do we understand and provide the tools and the capabilities to the community so that they can more effectively and efficiently design these vehicles, how they can bring the physics that are involved in making things more efficient and quieter into the design trades that need to be made when we're building some of these smaller vehicles. And oh, by the way, how do we do this safely uh, mm -hmm. as we're doing that? When we're looking at the larger vehicles in the new scale, we're trying to ask ourselves, what kind of benefits could we could we bring to, to uh, a design that has really matured very well over, over the years? Uh, we we, tr we kind of rec refer to these as tube and wing aircraft, because it looks like a long tube uh, with a wing on it and the engines, you know, potted engines. The, Aircraft have, you know, from a general sense, have looked very similar from the 707 to the 787, but then the technology that goes into those are really transformative. The the uh, the efficiency gains that we've seen in both the engines and the airframe are tremendous. NASA's played a large role in that, and now we're starting to ask the questions. You know, what else can be done? What can we do to make these systems more efficient? Maybe it is looking at different designs or different configurations that are now enabled because we have uh, things like composite structures that that allow us to do something differently. Um, I mentioned before some of the, the new architectures that we may bring in, into place. So while we won't have an all-electric large vehicle, what happens if we were to take energy, for example, from the engines and drive a fan somewhere else on the vehicle? We could maybe create something that's much more efficient than what we have today. So even about uh, almost 10 years ago, we, we set off on a new set of design studies. We called these N plus three, or looking three generations ahead of wh what would we be able to do with, um, with new designs. And we came out with things that said we could build vehicles that are potentially 60% more efficient than what we fly today. And what we fly today is very efficient. You know, Just ask, ask anybody who builds large aircraft uh, of what goes into that. Um, but that's a tremendous uh, advantage. And will we get to that point? Uh, I, it, it's hard to say, but the ideas are out there and we're working on them. We're bringing some of these concepts into the wind tunnels. We're testing these out. We're creating the, the computational codes that, to help predict the, the performance of these new vehicles. So, And we're even bringing some of these to, to flight and, and testing things out there too. So a lot of work is being done to create more efficient vehicles of all scales and, and NASA is certainly a part of that. And Alan, if I, um, if I made the from where I sit, um, when I was at DOT, one of the and when I worked on the Hill, I worked for um, two senators from from West Virginia, and so air service to me has always been about opening markets, opening communities, and you've seen a, a shrink in the footprint of commercial airspace to a lot of communities in in the U.S. And what I see, one of the benefits of some of these shorter range electric, but mid-size um, aircraft is that this may be a way, a cost-efficient way to get air service back to smaller communities. And in a global economy where people are shopping online and may possibly be doing their health care through um, some type of, ve involving some sort of vehicle, whether it's a drone that delivers their prescription drugs, all of these can improve people's lives and open markets and open communities. It's very true. We have dozens of airports going out of uh, online here in the United States. It's a huge problem where we don't have enough uh, tra air traffic going to them. Some of the smaller ones, the ones that aren't on the hub um, or in smoke uh, spoke model. So 
this is very interesting, and we're talk- we've talked about efficient use of the, uh, the airspace with some of these vehicles, but we, we should probably spend a little time discussing uh, how to manage the air traffic with a lot of vehicles flying in the sky. Uh, Greg, I'll go back to you on this, because uh, we had talked about it a little bit previously, but how do you, um, how do you create an air traffic control system um, that is lower to the ground to allow for some of these VTOLs? So, the, so, so again, this is a place where lessons learned from the unmanned world is very beneficial. So um, the drone world has worked hard over the last 10 years to, cr- to try to figure out constructs where they can do things like package delivery, where they can do things like first responder uh, assistance and, and even um, monitoring security issues. Um, and so from that knowledge and from the knowledge of the traditional world, you know, we see these new electric aircraft bridging those two things. And so there are, there are abilities to, um, to base aviation safety and aviation uh, sa- and, and spacing of aircraft on uh, the physical location of aircraft. And so with, with technologies that we have, I- instead of, in today's world, uh, as pilots, when an aircraft is converging with another and we see it visually, we yield to one of those two aircraft. And, and so the idea would be technology can let us see those things farther apart and controllers can, can work in the traditional realm and in these lower airspaces that might be more congested around non-traditional airports, um, things can be coordinated. We can do self-spacing, self-separation in these kind of constructs that the unmanned world has, has pioneered. Um, so so I, think, I think there are big opportunities there, but I will also say that we're at a crawl, walk, run phase of this. So the good news is it won't all happen overnight, right? We'll have few aircraft starting to trickle in, and as they grow to the capacity of that system, we will evolve to be more efficient. So, so it's not um, something to be afraid of. It's something that we all will work through. Great. Um, so I want to take the conversation and start talking about another one of these kind of large moonshots, which is uh, hypersonic flight. Um, so I'm going to go to you, Eli. Um, first of all, uh, what policy changes and technological advances do we need to not only leapfrog supersonic, but get to that goal of, 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 of having incredibly fast flights? Yeah, so I think it's it's primarily a technology issue. Um, we, you know, and I and I definitely want to get there, and Boom will, will probably be uh, the first uh, one there if I had to bet. Um, <laughs> <coughs> but you know, we still see it as a couple decades out, um, and it's it's a really hard uh, bunch of really hard technical problems. So one is is propulsion. So um, for you know, existing jet engines don't uh, really work well at uh, at Mach five speeds. Um, so we need in, you know entirely new propulsion concepts to to basically make it work. Um, in particular, we're, we're probably going to need variable cycle um, uh, technology. So so engine that operates one way, you know, around airports and, and close to the ground, and a, another way entirely um, when it's at cruise. And and some of those um, cruise. Uh, engines could be, uh, you know, air-breathing rockets um, or or uh, scramjets. Um, just you know, so it's going to be it's going to be really interesting to see what the propulsion guys come up with to uh, to support hypersonics, but um, and, you know, in a, in a sort of a cost-effective way, because ultimately that's what it's going to have to be. So uh, there's that. There's um, I think. Uh, another really important um, aspect of it is uh, variable airframe technologies. So if you think about, um, you know, when you're designing an airplane, uh, you want it to be very aerodynamically efficient. But what's aerodynamically efficient at Mach 5 plus is not the same as what's aerodynamically efficient, um, you know, again, when you're close to the ground and, you you know, you need to land at an airport. Um, so you're going to have to have uh, planes that, um, that, that change shape. Right, that that um, that morph, that um, have the have the wings that um, that go in and out, a swing wing design, um, but but maybe even beyond that, maybe other parts of the airframe are going to also have to have to have to change. And I think the the third real challenge is um, materials. So you get a lot of heat uh, uh, generated when you're when you're pushing through the atmosphere at those speeds, and you know you're basically um, it's like going through jello. Um, and, and and so it, it's just a huge amount of drag. You you hear about things burning up as they as they re-enter the atmosphere. Um, 
that's a lot of heat generated. So, so existing aluminum and, and you know, carbon fiber, which is what we're using at Mach 2.2, um, those, those start not to work anymore. So you start seeing people um, working on things like nickel and titanium uh, uh, materials. And, and, and who knows what will ultimately uh, win, but th those are hard materials to work with uh, from a tooling perspective and so on. So, uh, so we'll see how, how the uh, industry evolves to, to make those uh, materials work. I want to pull you back in, Jay, because I know hypersonic flight is kind of a moonshot for y'all, but you're working on it. Yeah, so we're absolutely we're involved in that as well. And I think Eli did a good job of, of laying out where some of the major challenges involve. I, I would to uh, completely agree. Uh, uh, propulsion is, is going to be high on the list. And, and really what we're talking about is reusability here. I mean, we have the ability to fly at speeds Mach 5 and greater. Obviously, we've launched rockets for, for really for decades. But how do we do this in, in a cost-effective, reusable manner? There is a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, also alluded to the high temperature materials and structures are, are going to be a challenge. Uh, a third area I'll, I'll pull back into that is really just our understanding and, and how you capture the physics properly and in the design tools. So even though um, we, we, we have a good grasp on how to do this, we're, uh, there's still a lot of work that remains. We're talking about very high thrust, very high drag. Your margin of error can't be much when you're, you're uh, doing the predictions for this. And really how you're account, uh, accounting for the physics of high-speed flight, uh, it, it really becomes much more complex than, than what we do today in, in subsonic flight. And how do you bring that together in an affordable way? And it really will become an integrated system. It's, uh, the, the propulsion system is going to be very highly coupled to the, to the aircraft structure and how you design that. So a, a lot of work uh, remains to be done, but again, that will offer you know, uh, tremendous opportunities. So it's, it's an endeavor worth, worth working on. And so, as we know, aviation is a very hard to decarbonize uh, sector, right? We've talked about that throughout the conversation. Um, as we're, when we're talking about these incredibly fast speeds, we have to develop some sort of new fuel altogether. Um, as, as kind of a progenitor going towards that, maybe, I would like to go to you, Eli. Um, how are y'all addressing the, um, the, the hard to decarbonize aspects of, of, of um, supersonic flight? Yeah, sure. So I think, I think we're actually, we're basically taking, um, it's basically three different approaches I think that that are they're going on sort of all at the same time and so one of them is is make the make the airplane as efficient as possible uh, to begin with so um, so most people think um, you know when you make an engine that's uh, you know X percent more efficient that gets you X percent uh, more uh, more fuel uh, uh, more mileage, basically. And that, that's totally wrong in, in aviation when you come at it from the perspective of aircraft design, because you save a percentage of fuel, uh, and that means that you can have a smaller plane, hmm. right? And that means that you, that you get sort of second order effects uh, when you design. And there's this there's a design spiral that enables you to to take advantage of um, of, of these second order effects. So, so you know, really, it's in incredibly important to us to have uh, to the most fuel efficient design that's possible with with current technology um, and then you know the second sort of um, thrust that that <laughs> we're um, that we're going for is uh, you know we're very bullish on alt fuels so there's alternative fuels that that can be um, you know net zero carbon, right? You, you, you take um, carbon that's existing in the atmosphere and either you, you pull it out directly or through through biomass or, or some other way, you, um, you you make it back into the fuels that you burn. So so any fuel that you burn is is carbon that was already in the atmosphere to begin with. So you can you can have a, you know potentially zero effect on, on carbon emissions. And then the third way that uh, the international aviation Industry is dealing with this is through through offsets. So so uh, ICAO uh, is adopting a framework called Corsia, and it's actually one of the most um, advanced offset frameworks anywhere uh, globally uh, in any industry. And, and you know it's going to cover uh, you know certainly ninety nine percent of all supersonic flights. Uh, any any basically any any uh, flight between two uh, two member states um, is going to be covered by this. Um, by this agreement, so so basically, um, you know, all supersonic aviation is going to be carbon neutral um, because it's going to be entering after the the Corsia deadline uh, starts uh, taking effect. 
well, you set me up perfectly because that was where I was going to go next. Um, before I ask this question, uh, we're about to go to Q&A, so have your questions in mind. Again, tweet us uh, your questions on the hashtag ITIF Aviation. But, Jenny, I want to go to you. Uh, did you get to in interact with Corsia as it was being created? Yes. Could you tell us our experience, your experiences? And also, what is Corsia? How does it work? Sure. So, um when I was uh, in my position at DOT, part of the work that we did was with the State Department on, and working with the international aviation community and working with ICAO on getting um, countries' commitment to Corsia. And this basically is a commitment from all of, from countries around the world to reaching carbon neutral status for um, for flights. For, um, for aviation and it's a major global environmental initiative um, that was was an incredible um, it was incredible in how diff how the world basically came together because aviation emissions cross you know country lines and um, there this was just it was just an incredible experience I actually haven't thought about it in a while but um, it was really amazing to see the commitments come in and I can tell you that people worked very very hard to make this happen um, and it is monumental and it is going to be transformative for this for this industry now and going forward and I'd like to to, yes. to touch on this one as well. So I think there's been a good discussion on on the impact on on the carbon issues through things like uh, improving efficiency or from alternative fuels. Again, both areas that we've worked, but it is also other areas uh, such as as emissions. And so one of the concerns said, uh, have been for supersonic aircraft in the past is high altitude emission or their nitrous oxides or NOx as we sometimes uh, call it. This is a good area where I would say it's it's the win-win and a good example where things are not just stovepipe within one particular area where it's supersonics over here or subsonic work uh, over here. Uh, so uh, we've been aware of, of the need to create what we'll call low NOx combustors or reduce the, the, the NOx output when we burn the fuel. And so that was an area where NASA was working on new concept or new ideas. Um, and then uh, several years ago, we created a new program called environmental, uh, excuse me, Environmentally Responsible Aviation, or ERA. And one of the things that we worked on there were, again, reducing the, the NOx output from these combustors, but for subsonic applications. And it was this research that was started with a focus on supersonics that really paved the way for the, the, the new ideas that we applied for uh, designing subsonic uh, combustors. And these new concepts able to reduce these NOx emissions by 70% or more. So a great win for both supersonics and the advancements that we've seen on the subsonic side will have benefits there, obviously, but also move the technology forward so that it will be available for supersonic applications in the future. So an example where I, it, technology really is pushing forward in this area. That's great. Uh, Greg, would you like to add anything? So I think that, that um, one of the visions I, I see happening here, um, and Eli, you, you kind of touched on it, I, I agree that the amount of energy needed in uh, supersonic and hypersonic flight, it's high, and, and chemical energy is a really great way to store that. So fuels and biofuels are a great way, and we kind of see those as um, a solar storage method of chemical energy, right? So uh, the sun comes and creates energy, and we turn that into liquid fuels. Um, and so uh, I kind of sum this all up in my head. Uh, you could imagine a door-to-door -door trip where, where a vehicle picks you up at your door, electronically fly, electrically flies you, to the boom aircraft and you're flown uh, across the oceans in hours. Um, you land at your destination and you're flown to the other door. And really that entire mission can be solar if, if, if uh, technology is employed in the right way, um, from, from the liquid fuel to the actual battery energy in, in the aircraft uh, that fly on each end. So um, I think it's exciting. I think we all have lots of fun work to do, um, but, uh, but that's why we're here, right? I would like to take a moment to plug two reports that ITIF released on Monday of this week that are about carbon emission, uh, uh, addressing some of these carbon issues um, from our energy team. It was uh, I would highly suggest you go and look them up at itif.org. Um, but uh, does the qu room have any questions? We'll move on to the Q&A portion. Yes, sir, uh, will you please wait for the microphone? Um, uh, please up here. Um, and will you state your name and organization uh, clearly? I'm Bob Hershey. I'm an independent consultant. I had 
done my doctoral dissertation on supersonic flight. I'm wondering what you're finding in uh, the uh, current uh, supersonic flights on effects on structures from the aircraft passing overhead. So you're talking about structures, houses, buildings? Exactly. So things like window rattle, for example, are a concern in, in issues. So when I talk about doing that community response, if, if we were talking about this back in the 1950s, that would be putting a sound jury, which means putting a number of people outside and listening to the boom. That's, that's not how we live and in, in, in work today. So, so that's a great question and a good example of what we mean by community response. It's really understanding what that effect is on all people no matter where they are whether they're indoors whether they're outdoors and so part of uh, so that is part of our research and so in, in coming up to what we think is an acceptable standard we've done things um, create models of building types around the world done actual experiments on a few we can't instrument every building but what we do is instrument a few uh, I mentioned these F-18 flights that we did we would fly those for example out in the Edwards Air Force uh, base region where we can fly supersonically where we can do this we'll take actually actual measurements and we instrumented structures out there we took that back and tried to how do we extrapolate that in our models so that we can do these predictions and so these are type of things that we're trying to, to also study and learn when we're doing things like the Galveston test that I that I alluded to. So it absolutely is part of this research now and I think is an example of how things are much different today than how they were before. Um, but part of the difference is also in the sound signature itself. So it's not just about making the boom quieter when we're talking about this, but it's actually changing the, 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 the signature. When we talk about uh, supersonic or a sonic boom, uh, we'll sometimes classify this as an N wave. It's a very sharp spike, a drop, and a negative pressure. And if you look at it, uh, plot it out it almost looks like an N. Um, because of, of how these designs break up the, um, the, the shocks, if you will, and how that coalesces differently, it becomes much more sinusoidal, so you don't have that sharp noise. So it's not just about the level, but it's also about the type of sound signature. So we're studying that effect on building structures, uh, window rattle, things like this, so that we can really encompass what it means to, to, to answer that community response question. You know, um, it, not in sight, in, uh supersonic and hypersonic but um, in urban air mobility I think some a lot of the companies that are investing in this technology um, like um, Airbus they are m doing different models and trying to come up with um, the type of data that they can use to make their case for their you know different type of uh, UAM structure so I think that the technology as, as Jay touched on is really really helpful in coming up with models and data that they can present to regulators and and I'll, I'll just add I was at the Galveston test so I'm very excited for the data to come back <laughs> yeah, it was, you know it's it funny because you you'd, you'd, you'd be there. You knew exactly when the boom was coming for those of us who were uh, observers, and and you could barely hear it, or you couldn't. I, there was one I didn't even hear. So, uh, very excited for that for that data to come back, and and I you know I fully expect the, the impact on structures to be uh, zero based on on on, on that experience. And Alan, maybe noise is a very popular subject. I'll weigh in as well uh, to wrap it up. So, but there is actually some really interesting things happening in in the study of noise right now. So as humans, um, we perceive changes in our environment, and that's what catches our attention. So it's not really that something is loud. So in this room right now, we hear a fan running. We're talking. There's some crowd noise, but. What catches our attention is sharp changes in volume or sharp changes in pitch over time. And so there's actually some science that goes into capturing how much of the public's attention is caught by certain changes in their environment. And that's actually where Heather Jenny alluded to with the urban air mobility piece is, is understanding the background noise of cities. And this is also helpful with sonic noise. And then trying to map into that urban background. So not only isn't the noise offensive to you, but you might not even notice. And the, and the metrics we're looking at using might be things like less than 5% of the population even realized there was a noise because it was so blended in the background right so this is the goal that we're shooting for it's a whole different kind of thinking than we've done historically and to put that into perspective like a lot of these different uh, sonic booms as they were are very are relatively low decimal like uh, a co one company that uh, I've spoken to uh, is it's looking at reducing the sonic boom from the Concord by at least 30 percent just by design alone um, so uh, we'll move on. Uh, another question back here. 
Hi, Sean Courtney with Bloomberg Government. Um, Jay, this question's for you. I had a question about the um, the pilot that you did off of the coast of Texas and whether your goal was to have a more formal pilot project, sort of like the DOT's been doing with um, the drone integration pilot project or the IPP um, and the data that they're collecting from that. And then second, uh, when you're talking about community feedback, um, is this something like if I went on Twitter, I could find people saying something about it? Like, how are you actually like talking to people in the community to figure out if they've heard it and what their reaction is to it? Right. So, so that uh, um, first of all, you know, to your first question, you know, is this a pilot to other things that we're doing? Uh, one thing I'll say: this wasn't just a standalone test where this is the first thing that we've done. We've done a lot of flights. In fact, there were some off the coast of Florida flying with a traditional sonic boom, where we were measuring or understanding the effect of turbulence. Or, on the sonic boom so that we could better characterize how it works. So this has really been what I would say one in the series of, of many flight experiments that we've done in, when it comes to, to sonic boom. Um, however, this was the first really focused on the community response aspect in in uh, 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 some period of time. The others were much more about understanding or characterizing the effect of the environment and, and the physics of the problem. So it's 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 the first of uh, I'll say a, a campaign that's ultimately going to be uh, lead to to. Um, campaigns with the X-59 around the country and and we haven't determined exactly how many of those flight tests or which cities will fly over though that that's research and work that's uh, still yet to be done but we have time to, to, to do that before those actually start so I would say this is the beginning of, of a long series of, of integrations and it's another reason why we are pulling the international community in when we when we are um, let, let me use just an example of how we've done this in another area and, and kind of build upon this and, and uh, it, it it's a little bit unrelated, but it was in the alternative fuels uh, area. We did some flight experiments with alternative fuels trying to understand those impacts. We did that NASA alone, um, collected a lot of data, but we shared it with the international community and said, what do we learn from this first flight experiment? How could we do this better? So we had purposefully set this as a, as a two-stage flight campaign. Um, we knew that we were going to learn things in that first that we were going to want to repeat. Um, so when we were flying the second time around, the Canadians brought an aircraft, the Germans brought an aircraft. It was a much more comprehensive experiment the second time around when we did that. So we're going to take lessons learned for how we did that with alternative fuels and apply it to how we're working with the, the sonic boom and the community response. So I would say this is the beginning of, of what will be that, that, that series of, of work that we're doing. How we're actually working or, or collecting that data with, with the, uh, the community, I don't think I could speak to some of the specifics on, on exactly how we did that. One of the things that we're working on, and we've had even some, some pilots leading to this pilot of looking at different sampling methods. You know, For example, do you tell people when the booms are going to be and then look for their response? Do you do it for a naive community and say, we're going to do it over this period. You tell us when you see it. There's different ways that you can actually collect surveys and, and how you do that. So we're, we're experimenting with what's going to be the ideal method, or do you have to apply multiple methods uh, when you do that. Um, as far as the engagement goes, we did have specific number of people, I think it was 500 in this case, that were specifically um, employed, I think, to, to, be, to provide some of that data and, and um, pr uh, give us some of that feedback on how we're doing. But it, it goes beyond just the, those people that we've sampled. You know, the, I, I alluded to it before, how we're interfacing with the community, other things that we've learned. And so this this has really just happened, so we haven't uh, had a chance to really delve into everything that we've learned from it. Um, but at least the initial feedback that I had from the team was it was completely successful in the sense that we've learned uh, a lot. It gives us some promising approaches forward. And uh, for, by all means that we've seen, I think it, it was a good engagement. Uh, now, one thing I did want to emphasize, this was not meant to be as much a test of the level as it was on the sampling technique. And so we actually varied uh, the distance that we flew some of these booms so that we could look at different uh, sound levels. So this was not meant to be a data collection to actually inform the standard, but more about how we're going to go about doing that. Um, more questions. Hi there. Um, I'm Brianna Gracciulo. I cover transportation for Politico. Um, I was curious uh, if you, each of you could talk about commercial space um, a bit. I don't think we've really dug into that yet and how that industry, which has been growing and from what I understand <coughs> is going to be growing a lot more in the near future, impacts uh, your members, your company, your clients. 
Do you want to start with Yeah, I'll start out. Thank you. So I think for us, commercial space is a wonderful example of the FA needing to take on a new challenge that spans across the FA and coming forward with a really collaborative and innovative approach. So uh, when you look at that challenge, they had um, uh, Congress basically mandated that the FA uh, integrate commercial space but not deal with the personal safety of that vehicle. So there aren't certification standards for those vehicles, but there are uh, air traffic and operational requirements that are in place. And so, um, you know, if you're going to take a object and shoot it through commercial uh, air traffic lanes and then have it fly and theoretically re-enter at any point along the way, that's a lot of coordination. Um, if you had gone to the historic air traffic organization of the FAA or the flight standards organization and suggested that could happen, I think you would have got a lot of blank, blank stares. But because the FAA worked together to integrate air, air uh, commercial um, space travel, uh, you're now finding an, an FAA that works together very tightly and is able to handle these kind of challenges. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of success in, in that, and I think the FAA is ready to see that grow into something. We would kind of say today it's in the walk stage, maybe the crawl and walk stage, and they're getting ready for the run stage. There's a new, uh, as you know, there's a new head of the Commercial Space Office, and sort of the prominence of that of the Commercial Space Office within the FAA has certainly grown by leaps and bounds in the last few years, um, and just there, just the importance of the the role that the FAA plays in authorizing this the space launch the space operations is huge, and I think that a lot of people don't realize that that is actually done at the FAA in cooperation. With NASA and the, you know, certainly the management of the airspace piece um, is something that we're we're all watching, and it's going to also factor in just as much as, uh, I would say that the FAA taking more uh, prominent approach with the Commercial Space Office just shows that they recognize all of the investment in commercial in the commercial space industry right now, um, and I think that that was a great signal. Um, to, to industry, just saying that we we see that you're out there and and, uh, and and backing that up. So I think it's really important. Yeah, and so from a NASA perspective, uh, let me just say, you know, commercial space is certainly important. It's not really under the purview of NASA Aeronautics where I am, so I'm not going to speak to the the, in, the the total NASA engagement. So it, it's really stronger from from the space side that that we have. Um, I will say uh, a, a little bit from a NASA Aeronautics piece, the the area I think where we have the most impact is is actually uh, what was was alluded to in the operations uh, piece. So there's a lot of work that NASA does to make the um, the operations you know, more flexible. How do we account for just this, this growing uh, mix of vehicles that we will see within the national airspace, whether it's supersonic, small vehicles, but including commercial space. So it's entering into our discussions when we're laying out some of that research that's setting the stage of how we'll control that. And and, and it brings me to one point I, I did want to say is, and, and Greg kind of alluded to this, is how the FAA operates. Um, we tend to focus a lot on the technologies themselves, what we're actually working on, but how we work some of these problems is equally important. And this is one of those areas where I would also argue that this, the, um, the coordination between NASA and the FAA has grown much stronger over the years. We've employed something we call research transition teams, especially in the area of these operations, where some of that early research that's ideal for NASA to focus on has FAA involvement to help guide, so we're very clear on the direction that we're going, that we have somebody that that we can hand this off to, that this team also oversees that transition, and then as the FAA moves to actually implement it, you have that, that back piece where NASA can help inform, here's what we did, how we can help make sure that that's successful. And I think we've really learned some lessons in, in how this will work. That'll affect not just uh, um, the flexibility that'll help enable commercial access to space, but really all the, the, the integration of technologies between the organizations. So just another area where that also applies. And then ultimately, just like we were talking in hypersonics, and this may be decades away, but some of those new concepts that you may see that enable some of the reusability, some of that initial work is being done today. And, and that's why it's important to, to think that even though it may take a long time for this to come to fruition, if we don't do it now, we can guarantee it's not gonna come to fruition. I think um, you know, what we see a lot in the commercial space industry is really a, a point of validation. Because if you if you think back, you know, ten years ago, uh, and you told someone, "Oh, hey, we're going to start a supersonics company," um, they'd be like, "Well, you're crazy. This is a this is a big um, this is a big industry dominated by big by big companies doing you know this is very capital intensive. It's it's, it's very hard." And, and so 
10 years ago, that's the response you would have gotten. And today, everybody knows about SpaceX and Blue Origin, right? And how they've, and how they've been able to uh, come in as a new company and, and completely challenge the existing industry. Um, and so, so for, for, for Boom in particular, you know, being able to come in and say, yes, we're going up against a, a, a lot of other um, big established companies in a very capital intensive industry in a very, very, um, you know, challenging product space. Um, but, uh, you, know, you know, I think we've, we've, we've come a long way already and, and uh, you know, flying our, our demonstrator uh, next year, about, about a year from now. Um, and, um, and, and so being, having that, that example of the success so far of commercial space has been, has been really um, an enabling factor for us. More questions. Alec? Hi there, Alec Stapp from the Niskanen Center. Uh, in a lot of industries, we've seen military research and development spending really make an early push in uh, advancing technology. I'd just like to hear your perspective on how that's been a factor or not a factor uh, in supersonic or hypersonic aviation. Yeah, so um, I can kick it off. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, right now, you know, we're targeting a, a, a cruise point of Mach 2.2. Um, there are no military planes that can supercruise at Mach 2.2. So we're actually, uh, it, 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 there, there are planes that can sprint at Mach 2.2. There have been planes in the past that could, could do it, but there's nothing today that exists that can, that can go at Mach 2.2 at a sustained, for a sustained uh, period. And so we're actually at a point where the civil application is more advanced than the military application, which is really, uh, I think, uh, interesting. Um, and I'm, you know, completely potentially shifts the dynamics of the industry. So we're, so we're, um, you know, we're really, really looking forward to that, um, seeing where that goes and, and seeing if we can, uh, continue to push the civil, uh, applications, uh, faster than the military ones. And, and, and I think what you're alluding to, too, is you know what we'll sometimes refer to as dual-use technologies, things that have a benefit both on the military applications as well as a, as a civil side. Um, so supersonics and hypersonics are good examples, but those aren't the only ones. Um, uh, in, in supersonics, you, you'll have areas like, for example, the low boom technology or how you design vehicles. That has been a commercial push. But there are things that we've learned in how we create design tools that, that shape the aircraft that may have other kind of applications that, that we'll look at um, that to create more efficient vehicles or, or do some things differently. Um, I, w I would argue that uh, a lot of the investment on the propulsion systems themselves have primarily been pushed on, on the DOD side that we can then leverage for things like uh, um, supersonic applications. On the flip side, a lot of the, the advances that we see for more efficient subsonic aircraft has been primarily driven by uh, commercial applications, yet we'll have military benefit into things like cargo or tanking uh, type of missions. Uh, when it comes to, to hypersonics, clearly some of the initial applications are going to be driven by uh, a military need, but ultimately if we can get to that reusability, that will have a, a commercial benefit. But even in getting there, we can leverage the experience, the data that are collected in developing some of these more military-focused things to help inform the, the new design tools, the test techniques, and the things that are going to be needed to create the civil applications. So they really are intertwined. And sometimes people tend to focus on just one or the other. And really what we're trying to do is find how do we basically, you know, from a government perspective, how do we make the most efficient use of tax dollars to, to enable research that's going to benefit both sides. Uh, another question? Gentleman up here. Uh, <clears throat> Nick Zulia, uh, Avionics International. Um, on the topic of the lessening regulations regarding supersonics, um, I'm curious if you guys see any potential for, um, particularly in light of the fact that obviously sound profiles and, and levels, ambient noise levels, are, are very different in different cities, different parts of the country, things like that. Um, see any potential for the regulations to be changed or loosened, but not done away with at some point, either temporarily or permanently. So, you know, in certain parts of the countries, you can fly over land or over certain cities or at certain times of day, things like that. Is that something that you think might happen, or do you think once you reach the certain threshold and demonstrate that, it's going to be a carte blanche thing. 
uh, maybe you I you can jump in next but uh, but I'll kind of say that one of the things that's really interesting right now is that the technologies for supersonic uh, flight enable um, shaping of the aircraft so that the entire sound wave doesn't reach the ground right so so the goal and I think Eli began the conversation today saying today's prohibition on supersonic flight that was based on the principle that supersonic aircraft make a supersonic boom noise um, and that's not necessarily always the case, right? There are ways to do things called mock cutoff, where you have like a, a less energetic supersonic wave that dissolves up in the effervescence of the atmosphere. There are ways to shape the aircraft so that it doesn't push um, the end wave uh, shape of the supersonic boom. And so as a result, um, absolutely, part of the goal right now is to understand what is tolerable, what, what, is, what is maybe going to blend into the background noise, um, and so that uh, supersonic flight can be done over land um, in ways that that doesn't bother people so and, and and technologically I think we know that's possible NASA's demonstrating it right now these folks are working on fielding it so um, it's a uh, it's absolutely the, the question right now yeah, and so I think that the the ultimate boom standard is going to be very data driven as we've already said and it's data driven in terms of um, you know community response and that can in certainly include different kinds of communities and and, and how if, if they respond differently, that needs to be taken into account. And it's also going to be data driven in the sense of like you know what what is achievable for different kinds of aircraft, um, because not not every aircraft is a um, you know small business jet that's going at a low Mach number. Um, so I think it's going to be it's going to be extremely data driven, and I think you know I think the standard's going to reflect that, and it's not going to be just a, a clean cut off. Um, you know, once you hit this level, then everything is fine. Un unrestricted below that level and completely banned above that level. I think it's there's going to be some some flex space. You've got major players joining into this world, right? So we've seen Arion, and they have a number of uh, uh, partners that they've joined with, GE from the propulsion side, um, Honeywell from the avionics side, and, and, and the flight control side, I believe. So you're starting to see um, really interesting uh, uh, number of companies move into that space and, and the regulators are certainly speaking more and more about that and it's one of the topics the FA talks about nearly all the time at this point. Exactly. Uh, more questions? Hi, Darby Becker with GE. I was interested in whether we're uh, getting to a place where the government is going to be ready for all of this innovation and Greg you talked about the FAA Office of Innovation and we also, you know, know about what NASA is doing in terms of collecting the data that will inform federal regulation. But what about um, states or localities? Are they uh, preparing for this next phase of aviation innovation? Are they forces for good? Are they potentially not? And, and what could be done to kind of think about um, next steps uh, for state and local government? Well, I'll, I'll take an initial uh, cut at that, and um, I think it, a little bit is going to depend on, on what we're talking, you know, which mode of transportation we're talking about within uh, aviation. You know, I, we, I think we've talked a, quite a bit about supersonics and how we're going to be engaging communities and how that will be part of that, that data-driven effort to, to help inform regulation. Uh, another area is this urban air mobility, which is more than just an air taxi. I mean, we could talk about uh, moving people, moving goods, and, and such. And so that's another area where NASA has been focused. And we've recently announced what we call a, a UAM challenge. And the idea is setting forth of how do we help uh, set the kind of stage so that we can demonstrate, understand, you know, some of these barriers, set the um, set the playing field, and, and to really allow the community to test just how good are we at doing this. So, fairly recently, back in November, we had a, a kickoff to this, an industry day, if you will, where we are announcing to the public, here's what we're going to do. Um, and this was both the NASA and the FAA uh, that were talking through this. Uh, it was very interesting, you know, back to your question, it wasn't just the people who build vehicles or who um, uh, work on the, the, the aircraft management systems or the air traffic management that might be employed for these type of vehicles. We had a number of, of um, you know, representatives from the mayor's office of, uh, of large cities that came and said, we're interested in this. We want to be involved now at the initial stages. So it was a really good positive sign that, that we're seeing this beyond just the aviation community itself, but really becoming a, a more global uh, community effort to, to be involved. And so this was just on urban air mobility, but it was a positive sign. And again, it's, it's uh, from our perspective, we're trying to reach out to 
more than just uh, the, the people who build airplanes or operate airplanes, but to, to the locales uh, and, and understand how do we better interface so that we can be successful. Anybody else? Um, another question? We have time for one or two more. If not, I have a couple more. Great. So um, we had briefly talked about automation, but we haven't really dove into that topic throughout this, this panel because I wanted to save time. Um, so, you know, many aviation accidents are caused by a loss of control or controlled flight into ter terrain or other pilot-induced errors. Um, and uh, automation might be a solution to a lot of these problems. Um, what is the current state of autonomous flight? Um, and what barriers do we need to overcome to develop and adopt it? Um, we can, I think all of you probably have thoughts on this, but do you want to, we'll start with Jay, how about? <laughs> now, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll probably avoid the question of saying, you know, exactly where is the state of the art because, and, and to really say that it's autonomy because even even just using that term, we could spend probably 30 minutes debating, well, what do we mean by autonomy? Is it automatic? Is it more uh, autonomous? And, and it, it really isn't, um, there's degrees of, of autonomy, I, I think would be maybe the safest way to say it on how it deploys. I mean, when we fly an aircraft today, we can have auto land features that can take off, it can cruise, you know, without the pilot touching the control, but we don't have also the regulations that are in place that says, well, we're just going to rely on that to, for the full operation. I, so I think the routine elements we can actually handle fairly well. It's really what the, I think where some of these challenges are going to be what we'll term the off nominal conditions. What happens when something doesn't go as planned? And this is the area where, you know, still, you know, the human interaction, that's why we have such highly trained pilots that, um, that are, are behind the controls. Well, again, most of these are routine flights, but every once in a while something does happen and we have a, a highly trained pilot to, to, um, to intercede and, and to take over. It's how do we bring up our level or our trust and autonomy to be able to handle those situations. We have to have a good grasp on what they, those situations are, and so this is where it gets into some of that prognostic safety that I was talking about. How do we understand these situations? How do we better, you know, uh, you know, create the systems that, that can deal with those? How are we going to certify a system like that are another one of those challenges. We have something in place for the systems themselves if we're going to actually certify an aircraft, whether it's an engine or the airframe. Um, we have a, a means of licensing the pilots that fly these. But now we're talking about something new. And so this is an area, I think, where the, the more research is needed to actually understand and inform how we're going to do this. So that's an example, I think, of, uh, of another area where more work needs to be done. And ITIF has another report that talks about algorithms and how to create accountability with, with them. Because uh, if as you make it more transparent to understand it, sometimes you sacrifice accuracy. And that might not be a good thing when it comes to flights, right? Uh, so how do you certify an algorithm if you can't necessarily see every aspect of it if it's controlling a, a, a flight? So Greg, I'd like to go to you. Um, what are some of these barriers that we're talking about uh, on top of what Jay said? Yeah, so so I think the um, the state of automation we live in today, as Jay, as you described, is is that we we like to default back to the human on each of our functions that were that are traditionally piloted functions. There are a lot of things on board the aircraft that are maybe once were traditionally piloted, and we don't worry about them anymore. Most commercial airliners, most business jets now have what we call FADEC, right? So they have a full authority digital engine control. We love our acronyms, right? But this means that there are no more cables between the pilot's command. That the there is a computer that's deciding what's safe for the engine to run. There is no backup to that. It, it runs on a high integrity system with many channels, and there is no reversionary mode, right? And so um, we've gotten very used to that, and, and we like that particular function. The state of automation we're in right now is looking at every piece of work the pilot does as a function. So the takeoff and landing function the pilot performs, the detect and avoid function the pilot performs, the stability control or the um, the preventing loss of control, the, the traditional um, you know stick and rudder skills the pilot brings to the table. And, and we're trying to say if we automated that particular function but still kept the pilot doing what pilots are really good at, um, kind of overseeing. And so the term the FA is starting to coin in these conversations is the pilot on the loop versus the pilot in the loop. Yeah. So that what humans are really good at, watching for the abstract, watching for the abnormal, and making executive decisions versus trying to be perfect Chuck Yeager every single day, um, you know, evolving that role. And I think that's how we all see getting to the next stage of aviation safety. Mm -hmm. And I think the FA is working on policies right now to take us there. Um, any final thoughts on this question? Yes, yeah, some of the other um 
I think this will also be uh, workforce driven. You're seeing um, a pilot shortage um, coupled with demand for more flights, particularly cargo. Um, and there's got to be a way to deal with this. And um, some people have thought about uh, king off of what Greg was talking about of how can we put a pilot in the one pilot in the cockpit to perform the the function of sort of overlooking what's going on um, and then relying on the aircraft to perform all of the tasks that it already already does basically through automation um, and there's there's a lot of you know heartburn right now um, I, th I would say in, in getting there, um, but I hats off to the FA. They recently had a workforce um, workshop and all day seminar on, on this issue, and I think that we we're going to have to look at this eventually. As can we use technology to deal with some of the workforce issues that we're going to have? And then the other thing is, um, we also need to train people, train maintenance workers um, and others to to work on aircraft that are going to be more technologically savvy that we may not be dealing with right now. So I think that we're going to see some changes. It's going to take some time and some political um, will on someone's part to get us there. But if not, we, you know, we're going to be dealing with some real workforce issues. And with that, it's 4.30. I would like to thank you all for coming out um, and, and uh, thank this panel for such great insight on uh, some of these really complex issues. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. All right.